Today is part four. Someone say part four uh, of a collection of talks that we began uh, the very first week of the new year entitled Mindsets, New Pathways for New Results. I don't know if you know this, but your brain, if you're using it, is creating brain waves. <laughs> and all of those brain waves are actually creating pathways. And what we've learned is we've actually learned that science tells us that we can change our brain, thinking new thoughts, thinking honorable thoughts. But not only does science tell us that through the practice known as neuroplasticity, but also God's word. Paul the apostle says that if you want transformation, you must renew your mind. In fact, Romans chapter 12, he says, it's through the renewing of your mind that you'll discover God's will for your life. I like the fact that he says the renewing of your mind. Meaning, last week if you renewed it, here we are again, we gotta renew it again. Because if I wanna change my life, I have to first change my mind. So this entire collection is talking to us about the simple idea that if we wanna change our life, we have to change our thinking. And we've been talking about the mind, uh, had a lot of different talks. If, you, if you've missed any of them, they're always right there on YouTube. Last week I preached a message called, Have You Lost Your Mind? And we're believing that people are going to get freedom in 2022. And today, I want us to look at uh, a portion of Scripture, Daniel chapter 1. We're going to go to the Old Testament. Someone say the Old Testament. And the Lord put a, put a word on my heart that I think is very, very important in this collection. We've got a few more weeks to go, but I think this is a message that it's going to be a challenge for many. But I also believe, once again, that if you can hear this word today and apply it to your life, you're going to find freedom like never before. The renewing of my mind is the process. I have to commit to the process of it. Daniel chapter one, I'm gonna read eight verses. I think you can handle it. This is an Old Testament story and I'm gonna put it into context today and apply it. It says this in chapter one, starting in verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Meaning Nebuchadnezzar came in and took it out and destroyed Jerusalem and, and took people captives. And it says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Watch this. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, hello, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Some of you girls are looking for a list of what you need to look for in a man. There you go, right there. This, this pagan king had a good idea about it. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Watch this. Among these were some, of, were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name bel Theshazar, To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach into Azariah, Abednego. Verse eight, but Daniel, someone say, but Daniel. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. He asked for permission not to defile himself this way. I wanna read it to you from another translation, the Berean. I, I, I discovered this a few weeks ago as I was studying and it just spoke to me. Verse eight in the Berean study Bible. But Daniel made up his mind. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's food or wine. So he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself. I wanna to preach today for the next 30 minutes or so from the subject, make up your mind. Make up your mind. If I'm going to be committed to the process of renewing my mind, how many of y'all know I gotta first start with making up my mind? 
I've got to make a decision on this Sunday today that I am making up my mind, that I am committed to the process of renewing myself day in and day out. I don't want to think last year's thoughts. I don't want to just think good thoughts. I want to step into the new thing that God has for me. How many know, I don't want to ruin a new thing with an old mindset. And a mindset is more than just my thoughts. It's a mood. It's an intention. It's actually the direction of my life. And that's what we are interrupting in 2022. Some of us were having a mood intervention, a brand new attitude. And I am making up my mind this year that I am committed to building my life on God's word. How many out there, you can just be honest, sometimes you have, you have a hard time uh, just making up your mind. Where, where, where are we at? Just a few of us? Okay, a few of us. What are you doing Friday? I don't know. You want to go to dinner? Maybe. All right, well, I got to know tomorrow. It's Tuesday. I can't tell you until an hour before on Friday. <laughs> where do you want to go to eat? I don't know. What are you feeling? Uh, I don't know. What are you feeling? <laughs> I don't know. What do you want? <laughs> How many of you just, I don't make, you, want, you don't have to raise your hands, but like one of the most stressful things in my marriage <laughs> is sitting down and opening Netflix and deciding on a film to watch. Anybody old enough, I know it's probably not in the evening service tonight. Anyone old enough to remember that place called Blockbuster? Yeah. Rest in peace, Blockbuster. We love you. We, we love you, Blockbuster. But I can remember going all the way back then, walking the aisles. Remember, it's like the action, you know, drama, comedy. And you would just, like half of the experience of renting a movie was just walking the aisles of Blockbuster. You ever go to Blockbuster and like, you're there for two hours? Like, we couldn't find anything, you know? <laughs> How many know we do this with Netflix? We're always like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Right. Many of us, what we don't understand is that we're living in a place of indecision. Yeah. How many you know indecision robs you of progress? You actually don't get anywhere not making a decision. My son, Wild, he's my second born. He is two years of age and uh, he is living up to his name. His name is Wild and he certainly is wild if you've met him before. And um, he has his own language, which is hilarious, by the way. He doesn't speak English yet. He just says, huh, eh, eh, huh. It's like, what was that? But, but he and I completely communicate. And uh, right now we're in a funny season in our home because we have a six-month daughter named Waylon in our house. And we're still doing the sleep training. Some of you who don't have kids, you're like, what does that mean? Believe me, it's a whole process. And so we're trying to get Waylon to go down for sleep. And so Don Shree has been sleeping in Waylon's room, just trying to help her at night. And so it's kind of put us in this weird little season where uh, Wyatt has been jumping in my bed and, and Wild, he's funny because he's very independent. And so he doesn't just follow what his brother does. And he certainly doesn't do what I ask him to do. <laughs> and so I've been asking him at night, I'm like, Wild, you know, do you want to sleep in, in dad's bed or do you want to go to your bed? And Wild will go, dad's bed. Dad's bed. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we, I go put him down in dad's bed. And then about 10 minutes later, I can hear noises from the room and I'll come in and Wyatt's always like, dad, I'm not speaking, you know, I'm not talking. It's wild. You know, it's like, it's like Cain and Abel. Like it's, it's my brother, you know, like it was him. And so I'm like wild and wild's always got this like grin on his face. It's just like full mischievous. You're like, dude, I totally believe in depravity after I've met you. Okay. So I go wild. I go, what, what, what are you doing? He's like, huh, my bed, my bed. I go, but bro, you just told me you wanted dad's bed. My bed, my bed. So I go and I pick him up and I go put him back in his own bed, in his own room. Like he doesn't want to be around in his own. This kid is independent. I put him in that room. But 10 minutes later, ah, I walk in wild. What are you doing? Dad's bed, dad's bed, dad's bed. And I'm still weak as a father. So I'm like, all right. So I put him in dad's bed. <laughs> 10 minutes later, ah. What are you doing? My bed, my bed. How many of you know, left to himself, his indecision will leave him restless. And I even just had this sense in my heart today, there's so many of us in the house that we haven't made up our mind, we haven't decided something, and it's leaving us in a state of being restless. 
It reminds me of Elijah as he stands before God's people in the Old Testament. And he says, how long are you gonna waver between two opinions? If Jehovah is God, serve him. But if Baal is God, serve him. Reminds me of the scripture in Revelation. It says, because you're neither hot nor cold, but rather because you're lukewarm, you're undecided, I spit you out of my mouth. Many of us in this room, there's a restlessness and there's an anxiety and there's a fear that continues to sweep over our life all because our progress is being robbed because we're in the state of indecision. What I love about my boy Wild is that he's only two years of age right now. And so as he cries out for his dad, thank God he has a good father, <laughs> that I can make a decision for him. I can give him the answer. Hey, Wild, that's enough moving around. Tonight, you're sleeping in your bed. No more, you're staying here. And how many know he goes to sleep? I want to encourage you today that if there's any area of your life that you have indecision, you have a much better father than I could ever imagine to be. You have a good, good father and he will answer you and he will come to your aid and he will give you wisdom. He'll help you make up your mind. This isn't just good preaching. This is what God's word says. James chapter one. Let's look at it for a moment because this is what the scripture says. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, I don't know what bed to sleep in. I don't know what job to take. I don't know how to put God first. I, I don't know how to lead my family. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. That's what we've been doing for 21 days. God, I'm putting you first. You're not my last resort, you're my first response. You should ask God, watch this, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But, everyone say but. Whew. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person, watch this, is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Unstable in all that they do. double Minded. He, he's starting to give you now some other analogies that you're tossed to and fro. When I live in a place of indecision, when I get God's word, when he gives me the wisdom, when I doubt his word, when I stall on his word, when I procrastinate according to his word, I become unstable. Some of you are like, okay, but I, I'm looking for an answer from God, but I can't hear God. Okay, when you can't hear God, you go to God's word. Some of you are like, I want a fresh word from God in 2022. All right, it might just start with you buying a brand new fresh Bible. Because God's not gonna say something that's not confirmed in his word. So if you're having a hard time hearing his word, maybe it's because you haven't already obeyed the word that he's already given you. And if you don't obey the word that he's given you, you're gonna find yourself unstable. This, this is like building language now, right? He's talking about foundational stuff. He's talking about what are you building your life on? We as believers in Jesus are to build our life on the word of God. It is a solid rock. The foundation of my life is not my feelings. It's not my experiences. The foundation of my life is discovered in God's word. How many of y'all know a building can look really good on the outside? But if the foundation is corrupt, it's only a matter of time before that building collapses. I wonder for many of us in this room, how's your foundation? I wonder for many of us in this room, have you made up your mind? What is your truth? Have you made up your mind? What is it that you believe? Have you made up your mind who God is? Have you made up your mind what he says about you? If you don't make up your mind, you find yourself in this place of being unstable. It's called indecision. And make no mistake about it. Indecision is a decision. I'm just waiting. No, you're not. Your progress is being robbed. You're restless. You're uncertain. My hope today is for some of you in this room that today would be a day that you make up your mind. This is what I believe about God. This is what I believe God says about me. 
And I wanna do that by looking at this story of Daniel because today I'm not gonna give you practical steps of how to make good decisions at your job, but I'm gonna give you some foundational things about making up your mind and getting the right mindset as you move into 2022. Uh, the, the story in Daniel chapter one is a very, very interesting story. And there's an entire book devoted to it, the book of Daniel. You can go back. Daniel is a prophet. Daniel um, is stolen from his home. That's in fact how the story begins. Uh, Israel at that time has been subdivided. Israel uh, is at the north and Judah is at the south. They have two different kings. But all of a sudden comes in Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, and he comes in and he besieges the southern part, Judah. And there's a king there named Jehoiakim, and he steals from Judah uh, all of the young men. He takes things from the temple. He comes back to his place, Nebuchadnezzar, which is Babylon. And, And Babylon in this time period is the greatest city the world has ever seen. It is large, it is massive. As you start to get the history, this is right around 600 BC, Babylon, there is no other city in the world quite like it. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of it. There's stories about Babylon that its walls are 335 feet tall. The width of these walls, 85 feet wide. There's stories that they used to have chariot races on the walls of Babylon. Yet Babylon is a godless pagan society. It's completely removed of God. It's got many different gods, many different false gods. They worship gods. They worship man. They worship their bodies. They're given over to all sorts of lusts of the flesh. That's what Babylon is. And really, as you start to get accustomed with with God's word, what you discover is that Babylon is so much more than just a city or a nation state. Babylon becomes an archetype in God's word. Like it's all throughout God's word. Like in it, actually the origin story of Babylon, just in case we wanna know, starts in Genesis chapter 11. Some of you know that story. It's the story where they're building a tower known as the Tower of Babel. And what is the intention? What is the mindset, watch this, to build the Tower of Babel? They say, let's build a tower so tall that we can reach the heavens. For when we get there, then we will be like God. Last week, we looked at how the enemy deceives us. How does he deceive us? He comes to us and he plays to our flesh and he gets us to question God. How did he do that with Adam and Eve? Don't you know if you eat this fruit, you will become like God? Pride, according to C.S. Lewis, is always, always, always at the heart of every sin. It's man's flesh and it's man's ego. And Babel is this tower to say, we want to be like God. It's the origin story of Babylon, but it shows up all throughout God's word. It actually is in the last book of the Bible, which is Revelation. And there's three entire chapters devoted to Babylon. But at this point, when we get to Revelation, Babylon is no longer a nation state. It is an archetype. It's a mindset. It's about this global economy and it's about this way of thinking. And it's about, it gives its way to slavery and injustice. And it's about power and and control. And honestly, if we're going to really be honest today, you go, well, what does Babylon look like today in 2022? It's not far from home. It's not far from where we're living in America today. And what's amazing is you study the story of Daniel. I actually think Daniel, we could do an entire collection, becomes an incredible playbook for any believer who's living in the world today saying, how do I behave? How should I think? How on earth can I get through all of the mind, uh, all the minefields and all the different things that are in my way? How do I actually, how do I navigate the things that are in my path? And I believe that Daniel, well, he gives us an incredible mindset. This idea that we've been talking about for the last four weeks is that the enemy, he has a plan for your life. It's to steal, kill, and destroy you. How does he do that? Well, he starts by putting the wrong thoughts in our brain. And then you and I, we click on those thoughts and then those thoughts give way into our life. We're talking about minding our mind. And I wanted to show you today from the story of Daniel here, I wanna show you just three basic steps of how the enemy plans to destroy you and what he does. And then I wanna show you what Daniel's solution was and how he fought back and he did not compromise. The first thing that the enemy does in our life is that the enemy, he wants to isolate you. It's called isolation. And this is what we see. Like he, he, wants, to, he wants to get you away. It's amazing that Peter calls the devil. He says that the enemy prowls around, roams around like a lion looking for someone to devour. 
Do you know how lions fight and attack? They don't go and attack a pack. Lions stalk their prey and then they isolate their prey so they can destroy the prey. I want you to understand that the enemy's first step in your life, his first tactic is always to isolate you. It's always to get you on your own. It's always to remove you from community. It's always to remove you from your home. What's amazing about this story is that the scripture says that Nebuchadnezzar, he goes in to Judah and then they, they steal from Judah these young men that are of the noble home. So just imagine for a moment, these Hebrew young men that are really in the royal house, they're probably not used to this kind of treatment, but we know some things about these young men, that these men are, um, they're handsome, they're smart, they're physically strong, they're well able, but they are removed from their home and they are brought to Babylon. They are living in exile. They are slaves in another place. It's always sad when one generation has to pay the price of the sins of a previous generation. We know in the history that Jeremiah the prophet had come to Judah, the nation, and said, repent, put God first, or there is gonna be calamity. There is gonna be a consequence. But they did not repent. They did not obey. And because of it, Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed Judah. I wonder how many of us in here, moms and dads, I wonder if we are setting the tone for our homes. I wonder if we're actually making a decision to say, it's not just about me, it's about the generations that come after me. I need to get the right mindset so I can see my entire home, my household following the ways of God. And these boys are ripped from their home and they're taken to Babylon. They're isolated from everything that they know and everywhere that they've ever been. And in the same way that these boys were isolated from their home, this is what the enemy tries to do in our lives. He, he comes to try to, to pull you away. Any area of your life that's walking in unity and health, the enemy seeks to create division. You have to understand this. You have to know that your marriage, if you're really gonna walk out a godly marriage, it's gonna be always under attack. You have to know if you're really gonna be a part of a life-giving church, it's always gonna be under attack. But he doesn't stop at isolation. The second thing he does is this word indoctrination. Because once the enemy isolates you, then the enemy seeks to indoctrinate you. And the idea of indoctrinating is this idea of like brainwashing you or giving you a new mindset, a, a brand new attitude, a brand new way of thinking. It's important if you're in God's house that you recognize that the world thinks very different from the kingdom of God. That's right. That's right. Two totally different mindsets. The, world, the world's always thinking temporary, but God's kingdom is thinking eternal. The world constantly over and over again is thinking uh, about pleasure, but, but honestly, the kingdom is thinking about joy. The world worships creation, but the kingdom worships the creator. The world thinks man is God, the kingdom thinks man is meant to submit to God. The world loves their sin. The kingdom hates their sin. The world seeks vengeance. The kingdom seeks mercy. The world holds on to unforgiveness. Watch this. The kingdom of God forgives 70 times seven. I have been forgiven. I'm looking for a reason to forgive. It's, it's two different mindsets. But what happens? They're taken from their home. And they're brought to Babylon, a brand new place, isolated, and now they start to be indoctrinated. Eat our food. Do what we do. Look, look what verse, five, verse four and five says. This is great. He, the king's official, was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. I want you to see this. Because it wasn't enough to simply learn the Babylonian way, they wanted them to behave like Babylonians. We want you to learn the language and the literature. It's not enough that you just get the knowledge about Babylon. We want you to take on the culture of Babylon. We want you to eat like the Babylonians eat. We want you to drink like the Babylonians drink. This is a completely different mechanism they talk about these things called like hard power versus soft power. And hard power is this explicit force to, to make you do something. It's like ISIS, you know, like that's hard power. Not all hard power is bad, 
the police, I'm grateful that we got some hard power. I'm grateful that if someone's doing something wrong, they can show up and that ain't right. That's hard power. But there's this other type of thing that the enemy uses in our life. It's called soft power. And it's small little things. It's ideas. It's thinking. It's getting into the core of your thought process. It's culture. It's media. How many know it's the little sins that are the scary ones? It's the little things that we begin to compromise on and allow in to our life that if we're not careful, it creates an instability. Before you know it, the building comes down. He, he isolates you. He indoctrinates you. Then watch this. The last word is this word, identification. Because once the enemy has separated you, then the enemy tries to indoctrinate you, and then the enemy wants to give you a brand new identity. This is wild. I mean, this is just like right here, play by play. Look at what it says. It says that um, he changes their Hebrew names to Babylonian names. So, so Daniel, his name is a godly name. In fact, all four of these guys have godly names. God's name is in their name. I just wanna say to you, if you're in Christ Jesus, God's name is in you. He's breathed into you. Daniel, his name means God is my judge. But it was changed to Belteshazzar, which means Bel protect his life. Bel was a Babylonian God. Are you seeing this? I mean, it's just like a full shift of the identity. Hananiah, his name means Jehovah is gracious. But his name was changed to Shadrach, which means the commander of the moon god. We see this guy named uh, Mishael. His name is, who is like God? What a beautiful question. What, that, that's a great, what if your name was just, who is like God, you know? You're just evangelizing everywhere you go. Who is like God? <laughs> but his name became Meshach, which means, who is like a coup? Another one of the heathen gods. This was all on purpose. Azariah, his name means, Jehovah is my helper. But his name became Abednego, which means the servant of Nego, another heathen god. These boys are isolated. These boys are indoctrinated. And then eventually these boys are given a brand new form of identification. And I just want you to know, this is how the enemy comes and attacks your mind. He wants to separate you. He wants to use soft power to indoctrinate you. And then lastly, he wants to give you a brand new identity. I don't know if you've noticed, but in 2022, people don't know who they are. People change every week and we don't know. It's, I don't know, I don't know. I'm unstable, I'm shaky. I have no idea who I am. No idea who I am. What do we do with this tactic of the enemy? How, how, do we, how do we navigate through this? Today is a very, very special day if you're any of our services live. Today is January 23rd, 2022. You say, Rich, why is that important? Because on January 23rd, 2018, my firstborn son was born into the earth, Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Wyatt. You're a good man. And to, to, once again, if you know a little bit about our story, like we waited eight years on a journey of infertility, we waited eight years, we didn't know if we would ever have kids. And the fact that we have three uh, is, is remarkable. But my first, there, there, nothing will ever compare it to, it was just a, it was quite the experience. He's a miracle boy. I mean, like he's, he's our miracle child. And so today it's his fourth birthday. And if you see Wyatt, he's like big. He looks big for his age. He looks like he's six, but he's four. And my new thing with him was like, hey man, can you just stop growing, you know? And so this morning he came to my room and he said, dad, you still want me to be a baby? I was like, yes, you know, <laughs> stay a baby forever. Um, this, the other day we, we had his birthday party. And so we've been preparing for his birthday and we kind of do fairly low key birthdays. Um, we try to keep it pretty chill. Some of y'all, I've seen your birthdays. It's like, wow, um, that's nicer than my wedding. Um, <laughs> How old is she? She's two. Wow, okay, all right. Um, but uh, we said, Wyatt, it was his fourth birthday. We said, we, we wanna give, a, give him a theme, give him a theme. We said, Wyatt, um, what, do you want, what do you want the theme of your birthday to be? And without hesitation, unlike his little brother, with, with sheer clarity and focus, I mean, he had made up his mind before the question was even asked. He said, I want a Spider-Man pirate birthday. I was like, what? <laughs> Spider-Man pirate. I go, I, and right away, I'm like, that doesn't exist. My son, Spider-Man pirate, dad. I want, I want a Spider-Man pirate. And so I started asking people, I'm like, is there, is there like a, 
Is there a Spider-Man pirate world? Like, is there a comic? You know, is there, has Marvel teamed up with pirates? I don't know. <laughs> like, I can't find anything anywhere this kid created with clarity and focus. I want a Spider-Man pirate birthday. And so I was like, all right, let's do Spider-Man pirate birthday. I'm not kidding. We, we went in. This is, this is Wyatt for his Spider-Man birthday pirate. <laughs> Nailed it. You know, <laughs> that joker's got a spider. And then the parrot, this is my pigeon dad. I was like, it's not a pigeon, but okay. You know, <laughs> my pigeon. I'm like, I think it's a, okay. <laughs> Spider-Man pirate birthday. How many know that a lot of us, we would hear that and say, that that doesn't work. Nope. The two don't go together. Son, I'm sorry. You're either Spider-Man or you're a pirate. But I like this Spider-Man pirate mindset because I think this is something that you and I need to take on. This is the framework, I believe, of Daniel and his friends. See, I'm guessing that there were a lot of Hebrew boys who had a different mindset. And the mindset was, I either live in Babylon or I live in Judah. I either worship the one true Jehovah God or I mock every day on Facebook every Babylonian God. I'm either or. But I wonder if Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego give us this other kind of mindset, which is this Spider-Man pirate mindset, which is, no, 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 you can have my body, but you'll never get my heart. You can have my presence, but you'll never get my mind. Why? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say to us in 2022, living in a modern day Babylonian empire that you can cooperate and not compromise. You can cooperate and not compromise. In fact, go back into the text because I've preached this and heard this preached forever. But if you really look at the text, Daniel agrees to everything except really one thing. Daniel, he cooperates, but he does not compromise. He's got a different mindset going on. He's thinking a little bit different. He's kind of thinking like my son. How do I make these things work? How do I live in this world, but not become of this world? How do I usher in God's kingdom, even though God's kingdom comes from the earth? How do I do it? I must not compromise. I think there's just three little things of how I defeat isolation, of how I defeat indoctrination, and how I fight back against this word identification. Here's what Daniel did. The first word is the word community. Community. Everywhere you turn, I'm telling you, everywhere that you turn in the book of Daniel, go and do it. You're gonna see it's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's like he understood, I'm going to need a tribe. I'm going to need a community. They took me from my home, but my home is still in me. They took me out of Judah, but Judah is still in me. Friends, we must make this a value point. If you're going to make up your mind, if you're going to walk in stability, you will not be able to do it alone. You need men and women left and right. You need a community. You need a tribe of people saying, we got shared values. We're not better than everybody else. We're walking together. We're helping each other. I love the idea of trees. <laughs> I was reading this past week that trees, their root systems are signals. If there's ever a tree that's in need of nutrients, one tree, the mother tree, can send nutrients to other trees through their root system. It's wild to me. What's even more wild is the prophet Jeremiah, written thousands of years ago, says that you and I are like trees. That you and I, we stand with each other and we help each other and we walk with each other. We're not here to judge one another. We're here to serve each other and carry each other and love one another. It's like this week is a crew week. 
And when I start to recognize that I have to make up my mind, I just make up my mind. I'm gonna live my life in a VU crew. I'm gonna do life with some people. It's not just some program, it's a people that I'm attaching myself to because I recognize that I'm living in exile. I'm recognizing that I'm on the fringe. I'm not at the center of culture. We're being pushed out as believers, but if I'm gonna hold true to what I believe, if I'm gonna continue to receive the wisdom of God and plant my life on a solid rock, I need the root systems of others that when I am sick, there's others that send nutrients my way. We, we, we need each other. We're not meant to do life alone. And the enemy, he wants to separate you. He wants to isolate you. Let me get you out of crew. Let me get you off your team. Oh, you don't really need to go to church to be a believer. Don't you know? It's just about believing. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. But man, I don't know about you. I've just, I've learned quickly in my life, my commitment doesn't do very good on my own. It always does better with other people around. We, we need each other desperately. Daniel, he, he keeps a community. Even in exile, he's got men around him that he's doing life with. But it's not just community. It's the second word, it's conviction. See, see kids um, obey all their compulsions. It's wild. Dad, dad, my bed, your bed. My bed, your bed. Bro, you're never gonna sleep. Wow, you live like that, you're never gonna get peace. Christians, we don't follow our compulsions, we follow our convictions. And the only area that Daniel didn't cooperate, and I even love this, because I want you to see this in your workplace. I want you to see this on your job site. He asks for permission. That's a humble thing. It's my right. I don't need to ask for permission. All right, you're gonna get slaughtered. You're not gonna make it. You're not gonna make an impact. Daniel says, can I have permission? Let's, let's make a deal. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna eat that food. Now, this is important you understand this. He's living under the Levitical law. The reason why he can't eat the food and drink the wine is because number one, to eat this food is probably not kosher. The meat, the way it's prepared is not according to God's word. So he's breaking the law by doing that. But even probably more importantly than just that part of the law, this food has been offered to other gods. And it wasn't just about eating the food. It was about a co-signing that I'm putting my trust in something else other than the one true God. And so he even asked for permission. He's a slave, he's living in exile, but he has a conviction and his conviction is, no, 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 no. Um, I will learn all that it means to be a Babylonian. I'll go to the classes, I'll go to the university, send me your stuff, I'll read it, I'll get acquainted with it. I will understand the mindset of a Babylonian, but I have some lines that I gotta draw. And I would say the same for you and I, this is what a conviction is. What are your lines? Because if you haven't drawn your lines yet, you will always be pushed past them. It's not my doing to tell you what the line should be. You have the Holy Spirit. He's known as the comforter and the convictor. He will declare and speak to you. That's not for you to do. I have all sorts of convictions that if I got up here and started preaching to you, before you know it, it would become a legalistic message. It would become a burden on your back. You and I are on two different journeys of following Jesus. And the Spirit, as I grow and mature in Him, He presents me with new convictions, new lines. New lines. I don't judge you for crossing my lines. I just know where my lines are. And I'm not eating that food. So I ask for permission. In fact, I'm gonna use strategy. I'm gonna rule it all in before I rule it even out. I'm gonna use some wisdom because God gives me wisdom. Here's my strategy. Why don't you let me um, and my, my guys, we're gonna just do vegetable and water. Some of you all just did 21 days of the Daniel fast. This is the original Daniel fast. Some of y'all adding some weird stuff, you know. Smoothie King, that's not the Daniel fast. No. God bless you. There is no condemnation for those who tried. All right. I, I just, I'm gonna eat vegetables and, and, and water. And let's just, watch this, he goes, let's just see after 10 days how we all, how we all look. Just give me 10 days. Can, can, I, can I get 10 days? I love it because he's got a conviction. And I just wanna challenge you today. You gotta make up your mind today about your community. You gotta make up your mind for your home, for your convictions. Dad's in the house, parents in the house. 
you got to help draw the, you think, you think that this place is going to do all that for you? There's no way. It starts in your home, drawing the lines. He, he's got community. He's got convictions. And lastly, as we close, he's got this word called character. Character is birthed out of identity. So he's got a tribe. He's got some convictions, some lines that he's drawn. I'm not crossing that line. I'm not crossing that line. I'll, I'll be humble. I'll ask permission. I'll learn your ways. I'll learn all about it. But yo, my, my mind, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm living in Babylon, but I'm, I'm not a Babylonian. I'm, I'm, I'm Spider-Man pirate. But character comes from identity. And here's what's powerful. As you read the book of Daniel, not one time will you ever see Daniel calling himself by his Babylonian name. It's not called the book of Belteshazzar. That's got a creepy ring to it. It's called the book of Daniel because we know that he, he wrote this book is what almost every major scholar believes. Here's what's really cool. As you read the different writings and as they've been translated down, what they saw over and over again was that the name Belteshazzar was misspelled over and over. The first time they thought it, they saw it, they're like, oh, he must have made a mistake. But as they saw it over and over again misspelled, they recognized, wait a minute. <laughs> maybe, just maybe this was on purpose. To say, you can try to change my name, but you can never steal my identity. You can call me what you want, but I know who I am. I know who I am. So the scripture says that Daniel, he resolved, or in verse eight of the Berean, he made up his mind not to defile himself. I'm making up my mind. I'm deciding today. I'm choosing today. I'm a person of community. I'm a person of conviction. I am a person of character, and my character comes from knowing who I am. So what does he do? He says, give us 10 days. Just give me 10 days. I'm not going to give me 10 days. And the scripture says after 10 days, they come back and present themselves to the king's official and the king's official is blown away. They look better. They behave better. They perform better. They are better. In fact, he's brought into the king's court and Nebuchadnezzar sees him. He's like, yo, you're not just better. You're 10 times better, 10 times better than every one of my men. Why? Because when you take on a new mindset, when you know who you are, before you know it, as you honor God, God makes a way for you. You don't have to sell your soul to get ahead. You don't have to say, wow, that's it. I'm either this or that. You can say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I'm making up my mind. I'm gonna cooperate, but I'm not gonna compromise. I know who I am. I know who I am. And as cliche as it sounds, it is still true. You'll never know who you are until you know whose you are. I take on the name of God. I'm a child of God. Say what you want about me, but I know who I am. I've got some convictions. What I love about Daniel is Daniel, those convictions, it wasn't just about drawing lines. His other conviction was, I'm going to practice my faith. And we see this, I mean, Daniel had favor at the start of King Nebuchadnezzar, decades into King Cyrus. I mean, he served lots of different kings in Babylon and over and over again, there was different tests, there was different trials, but Daniel, he overcame and he won the victory. One of my favorite stories about Daniel is they came to him, they tricked the king named Darius. They said, Darius, let's make an edict in the, in the nation that if anyone is caught praying to any other God other than you, they'll be thrown into the pit with lions. And Darius, his ego and his pride was like, yeah, that sounds good. And so he puts this edict out, but he had forgotten about Daniel. Daniel was one of his favorite counselors. So they put the edict out that if you pray, you will be thrown into the lion's den. And Daniel read that edict. And then like he did every day, it was his custom. It was his practice. He went up into his room. He opened the windows of his room and three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed publicly and openly. And I can hear everybody saying, but Daniel, Daniel, don't you know, if you pray, you're gonna be thrown into the lion's dead and you're gonna be dead in the den. And I can hear Daniel respond back, don't you know, if I don't pray, I'm already dead. I have made up my mind. 
that I'm putting God first. I have made up my mind. I'm not living in indecision. I have made up my mind to focus on him and to practice my faith. Today's the day to make up your mind as you stand to your feet all over this room. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. There is an enemy who wants to isolate, indoctrinate, and change your identity. But there is a God who's given us an exit strategy. It's called community, conviction, and character. My character comes from my identity. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I pray today for your people in every location, wherever they're tuning in from right now, online. Lord, help us today to, to see both and. That Lord, as we live in Babylon, we don't adopt the ways of Babylon. As we live in Babylon, it's not our tactic to mock Babylon, to be rude to Babylon, but it is to stand firm. Give us a healthy mind, Jesus. Give us the mind of Christ today. God, we come against fear and worry, come against anxiety in this house. Lord, we are like trees planted next to one another that when one is sick, we send nutrients that way. I pray for anybody who's watching today, Lord, anybody who's in the room today, anybody today, Lord, who's feeling dry, anybody today who's feeling the fear of the world, I pray, God, that nutrients from brothers and sisters in Christ would be sent that way, that we would carry each other's burdens, Lord. Carry each other's burdens. Thank you, Jesus. God bless your people. Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to, to come. come.